Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and in each episode, we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration and aiding you on your journey to optimal health. Today, I am so excited to talk to my colleague, my neighbor, my friend, Dr. Will Vanderveer. He's a medical doctor and co-founder of the Integrative Psychiatry Institute, which offers comprehensive training for mental health professionals in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy and other continuing educational programs. He's the medical director of Integrative Psychiatry Center of Boulder, Colorado, providing integrative psychiatry and a broad range of conditions and ketamine-assisted uh, psychotherapy for treatment resistant depression and PTSD. And being in your neighborhood, Dr. Vanderveer, I've had uh, multiple patients who have seen you, you or your clinic and had mm. great results. So I can attest to the power of what you're doing here locally. In addition to his clinical practice and teaching, he's been involved with several studies sponsored by MAPS investigating MDMA assisted psychotherapy for chronic treatment resistant PTSD, a breakthrough treatment which could be approved in late 2024 by the FDA. So today we're going to dive into some of the most cutting edge treatments available for depression, anxiety, PTSD, and many other things. So Dr. Vanderveer, I am so glad to have you here. Welcome. It's such an honor and pleasure to be here, Jill. Thank you so much. Yeah, mutual, mutual pleasure and honor. Um, it's mine as well. Um, I always love to start with story of just how did you get into medicine and then how did you get into psychiatry and tell us a little about your journey to where you're at now. Well, I took a somewhat uh, unusual path into medical education. I wasn't pre-med in college. Uh, I was studying psychology, anthropology, art history, uh, French, and so on, liberal arts. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled into an independent study with a mentor in the psychology department who sent me over to the hospital to interview people who were having acute psychotic episodes for a study. And somehow I, something clicked and I said, I need to be around these people. These are my people. Wow. And so I needed to do two years of pre-med and that whole path, and then ended up um, being advised that in my medical school interviews, do not tell them you want to go into psychiatry. Tell them you're open-minded. You are, you know, I'm warm clay to be molded in your hands. I could, you know, I could do anything. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so I was a little bit of a covert, um, pretty sure I wanted to do psychiatry and, and you know, on my way in. Uh, but I absolutely loved the body and anatomy and physiology and almost moved over to um, internal medicine throughout the path there. But I just, uh, there was something about listening to people's stories, uh, talk, speaking of stories, that I just loved. And I wanted to have the time and the space to be able to sit with people's stories. So I picked psychiatry. Wow. Um, I love that because I really think there's no more fascinating area that really needs transformation. And you are on the cutting edge um, because typically we you know, associate with it, a, you know, here's a diagnosis ICD-10 and then here's a drug. And in this realm of all realms, there's so much more, right? There's so much more, whether it's trauma right. or whether it's somatic experiencing or whether it's psychedelics, which we're going to talk about today. Um so you were obviously traditionally trained like me. Um, what did you see in the system that made you think was working? And what did you see that made you kind of delve into other options? Um, because obviously we know our traditional medical system has strengths and it also has weaknesses. Sure. Well, I was at Vanderbilt Medical School and I was um, just, I loved the learning. You know, it was so, so fun to learn so much in such a short period of time. And uh, I loved being in the surgical suite. I loved, you know, being with babies being born and so on. Um, the whole technology and what is what's possible in terms of saving lives was just mind blowing to me. And at the same time, I felt like as I looked around, I, I saw in psychiatry, a pretty limited set of tools and pretty old fashioned thinking. It seemed like to me. And um, that was at a time in the 90s when the myth of the chemical imbalance was still very much a popular uh, narrative mm -hmm. about what people were dealing with. 
And so, you know, I was a student, so I, I, I listened and I started telling patients that, uh, and then of course, you know, we can get into the future of what, what happened with psychiatry, but it's, it's quite sad because yeah. in, in the field of psychiatry, we had, uh, medications and psychotherapy, but not much else. Um, and, uh, when I was in medical school, I'm curious if this was the case for you. I'd love to hear your answer to this question. Um, I had one hour of nutrition, Yeah, not a course, but yeah. one session. Yeah. Quite impressive. Yeah. And most of much of it was how to give TPN after surgery or, you know, which is IV <laughs> nutrition for those of you who don't know what that, like how to give someone with, they can't eat um, they call MPO, you can nothing by mouth. And then we yeah. would learn how to give them nutrition in their vein. Right. That was it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, intense. Yeah. yeah. And so powerful because they think about mind or body and how important are the, are the inputs, right? And yes. yet we weren't learning in medicine that these things do have an input or a, a play in our, in our mood and in our gut and all these other things. So true. Yeah. There was no such thing as a gut brain connection uh, when I was in training. Yeah. yeah. So fascinating. So then Obviously you got a wonderful training in traditional medicine and you know what the drugs were. I want to just go back to, you mentioned that um, uh, serotonin deficiency or some of those kinds of myths. I want to just maybe talk briefly about that for those listening that maybe don't know that this has actually been disproven because I think a lot of people are still out there under the mindset that if they have depression, it's a serotonin deficiency or just propagated a little bit by the pharmaceutical solution and then why that may not be true. Well, I think the biggest um, shattering piece of information, well, I try not to go too deep in the rabbit hole of neuroscience here. So everyone's probably familiar with SSRIs. So um, the serotonin transporter uh, gets blocked so that serotonin can't be recycled out of the gap between neurons back into the original neuron it came from. And the theory was that having more serotonin in the gap meant that the serotonin receptors on the uh, distal neuron get stimulated more. So you have more serotonergic um, activity going on. Well, there was a drug in Europe that was approved for depression that has exactly the opposite mechanism of an SSRI, and it works for depression. So I could talk about a lot of other examples of how that myth got disproven, but the point being that um, you can block that serotonin receptor and it does something. You can accelerate or make that receptor more active and it does something. And so this story that, oh, I need to block my serotonin receptor so I can have more serotonin in the synaptic cleft, and that proves that I have low serotonin and that's why I have depression or anxiety. It just doesn't hang together. There's a whole bunch of other ways we could talk about it, but I think that's the simplest. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Cause again, I just, uh, you and I know this and I want to make sure listeners are aware that, um, the old school eighties, nineties, even early two thousands was, oh, there's a deficiency. And so we just need to, the simple solution for depression is just make more serotonin. And that's just not true. It's so right. much more complex than that. Um, I want to dive into today, our topic is psychedelics, and I want to dive into all about that. But before we do, what did you, as you started to shift to integrative psychiatry, obviously the gut brain connection, the food, what did you find with depression were some of the underlying kind of things that really did make a difference on a more holistic perspective? The thing that really shifted my life really was an experience with a patient. And I'm sure that you have other guests on who have a similar experience where one experience with one patient just completely changes your career. So I had been out in practice for a couple of years. It's the early two thousands. And I was so discouraged by the lackluster effects of the medications and the cognitive behavioral therapy that I had been trained to provide. And I was doing a good job within, you know, yeah. board certification, all that uh -huh. kind of stuff that I actually quit psychiatry and I was very devastated. I was, I thought I was leaving medicine for good. Wow. Um, and I moved to a small town It's a long story for another time, but I became like a really hardcore meditator and I was meditating for hours a day. And I was thinking about, you know, what went wrong. And I used to come back to Boulder, um, to 
get groceries. And it was a four hour trip from Crestone way down in the Southwest of Colorado. And on one of those trips, I ran into a former patient who had had uh, very severe anxiety. Um, he had panic attacks. He couldn't go outside. He couldn't date. He couldn't do much of anything with his life. And I had treated him with an SSRI and cognitive therapy, and he only got about 20 or 30% better. So I run into this guy and he says, look, um, hey, thanks for the talk therapy. I think that helped me some. But I want you to know that after you left town, I went and saw a naturopath. I got tested for celiac disease. I came back positive. I stopped eating wheat. And within six weeks, my anxiety was gone, completely gone. Then I gradually, carefully, under supervision, weaned off my medications, and I still have no anxiety. Mm -hmm. And the light bulb went off of, wait a second, is there a connection between the gut and the brain? How can that be? And so I realized in that moment that I just hadn't been told the whole story about what was really going on with people. Um, the serotonin drug I gave him didn't work very well for obvious reasons that we could talk about now. But the point being that it put me on a path of like, wow, here's another opportunity for me to learn. And so I just went on a tear and started learning all the different things and you know, hormones and inflammation and, you know, environmental toxins and the gut brain connection and started testing people for, you know, let's test your poop. Let's do, right. your heart, you know, and <laughs> it was really, uh, it was a wild time, but I still didn't, as you pointed out a moment ago, didn't have a great tool for the trauma piece yeah. and which in psychiatry, of course, you know, working with the software in addition to the hardware is so important. Yeah. Wow. I love that story. Um, it reminds me of, um, it, recently I went to Australia and I'm, I'm celiac completely gluten-free. And for some reason I had got this organic bread that had spelt, I didn't see it on the list. And I, thought, I actually didn't know it for three days and my uh -oh. gut was perfect. But two hours after I had that bread, I get really depressed and irritable. And later, three days later, I looked at the ingredients like, what is going on? And it's spelled like, oh, wheat. And one thing many people don't know is, yes, people present with gut issues with celiac or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but I think it's a 50% present with brain and typically it's fatigue, anxiety, depression. So I love that story because it's so relevant. Um, and I remember years ago when I first started to integrate a functional medicine, I get these college kids come in and like, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. And I'm like, well, let's check your stool. And they would just look at me like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so it is funny because then you're like, okay, well, there is a connection. I know that sounds crazy because the college kids are really, you know, uh, nervous about giving stool samples. <laughs> so, For sure. Um, totally get that. Um, so I love that you talk about software and hardware upgrade. And then let's just get into psychedelics because I want to hear how did you shift? So you kind of started doing integrative more whole body. And I'm sure you had some great success stories, probably even more so because you still had the great tools. Like what's great right. about you and I is we still use medications and, of course. and and things that are appropriate, but the toolbox is just way bigger. So you were having success. When did then you find out about psychedelics or start to look into that as a possibility? Well, I was on um, kind of a, and I continue to be on a deep, uh, I think just learning journey about my own health and my own psychology. And as I mentioned earlier, it started with meditation. And then uh, at one point about, uh, I would say 15 years ago, a friend of mine in the Buddhist community invited me to an ayahuasca ceremony and I went and um, I had not, I was not a psychedelic person whatsoever, but the prayer that the shaman from Peru um, gave to it actually the ceremony was on mother's day and so he was he was acknowledging all the mothers and his mother and mother earth and all of these mothers and i was just bawling my eyes out because i realized you know and this was what at the age of like 40 i was like all of a sudden i was like oh wow i'm still mad at my mom <laughs> oh, yeah. i've got work to do here yeah. and it cracked me open and uh so that actually became uh, a really deep healing for me going down that road in South America for many, many, many years. Um, and, uh, but I was doing it, um, afraid to be found out about it. You know, I, I was, I wasn't talking to my patients about it. I was scared if any doctor friends found out they might report me to the medical board. I mean, this is the world that yeah. we kind of live in, right. Is like this scary, um, situation. So I felt more and more 
pulled apart between like what the tool was that was helping me so much and what, how my patients were struggling. And I felt that it was not the right way to do it, to talk to them about what was happening, you know, what was helping me until a friend of mine, um, you may have known uh, Jeremy Geffen, who's an oncologist in town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, uh, he rang me up one day and he said, well, they're, they're going to be starting an MDMA assisted therapy clinical trial in Boulder and they need a psychiatrist. And oddly enough, it's hard to find a psychiatrist who embraces uh -huh. MDMA therapy. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I said to him, look, isn't that the stuff that causes holes in the brain and is really bad for people. And, you know, people die of hyperthermia and raves and so on. He said, look, read this paper. And it was a, it was a 2011 uh, phase two clinical trial where people with chronic treatment resistant PTSD, decades of PTSD symptoms, nothing had worked, yeah. went through this protocol and 83% of them no longer met criteria for PTSD. And I thought to myself, you know, that is like, if that's the opposite of what my rates of success are in my practice. Like if I get 17% of people, well, yeah. I'm pretty psyched. Right. So, so that, that got my attention. Here. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. yeah. So that oh, was my that entry point. The first, uh, like, like, oh, maybe. And of course you had your own experience with uh, sim. I mean, just in a realm mm -hmm. that you had obviously had success personally. Right. So then I found out about MDMA being used, not just for, you know, parties, but for, actual therapy and healing and got trained in that method and, and became uh, a member of that uh, research group. And, and I was able to refer a handful of people out of my own practice who had struggled uh, under my care for years and who came through the protocol and had, you know, three MDMA sessions and didn't have PTSD anymore themselves. And it was just magical to see so much healing happen in such a quick Time frame, So it was really encouraging. I feel really encouraged right now about psychiatry, which I haven't, you know, I, I didn't feel that way 20 years ago for sure. So it's exciting what's happening. Yeah. And there is clinical evidence. Do you want to talk just a little bit about what the clinical evidence is right now on psychedelic therapies? Because I think um, there is still a stigma. It's kind of too mm -hmm. bad because uh, whether it's, I mean, I always say like even, um, uh, marijuana or some of these things that are starting to be legalized and everything, everything has its own niche. But if you look at like prescription opioids, I think there's just like, it's, it's all segregated based on politics and different things that really aren't science-based. Um, right. And this idea, like you said, in medicine, we don't do certain things. Right. And some of this stuff that we just, one thing I hear in your story is that you remained curious and open-minded and I think that is probably the core reason why you're here leading the pack mm. on this topic, um, because curiosity, even for me, I mean, I do things very differently than a traditional trained MD. And part of it was because I remained curious and open-minded, but it takes right. you and I and a ton of colleagues to be open-minded, to really shift medicine in the areas where it's not working, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I agree. And, and, and we also go through things uh, like, yeah. I know you've been through so many yeah. things with your health and, and, and this teaches us a different way of looking at things. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It almost says healer. We have to start with ourselves. Right. And then we learn, right. and again, that's something traditional medicine. Our training was like, don't you dare talk about yourself. Don't you dare talk about your experiences. Keep the wall up between your patient. And what we right. realize is story for generations and thousands of years has been the connective tissue for healers. So if we are yes. telling story and, and at least commiserating with patients in their suffering, what kind of a healer are we, right? It's like so 100%. powerful. And so, yeah. so back to evidence, do you want to share a little yeah. bit about how that's come around since sure. you first started looking into this and what the clinical evidence is currently? Right. So I'll start with MDMA uh, where, where it's a, a much clearer conversation. So the study I was a part of uh, was uh, one of the last phase two studies. We published that paper in 2018 and then a phase three study unfolded from there. It just got published in September um, the results are outstanding in terms of efficacy as well as safety. So it's very much on par with the kind of results that we saw, um, two thirds of folks with chronic severe PTSD, not meeting criteria at the 12 month follow-up. So very exciting. Um, and the FDA is reviewing, uh, the data and we'll know soon in just actually just a few weeks from the time of this recording, uh, what, what FDA is going to do with that. 
Um, it's a little challenging because the FDA's never had to review a psychotherapy assisted with a psychedelic, um, yeah. <laughs> let alone a psychedelic before. So we'll see how that goes. So that's the story with MDMA. Um, and for folks in the audience uh, who are not familiar with it, it's for me, uh, as I think about it as a clinician with various tools available, I think it's the cat's meow uh, for treatment of, of trauma. Um, yeah. People with simple um, single event type of trauma may not need MDMA therapy, maybe EMDR, or you mentioned somatic experiencing, which I'm a huge fan of and trained in myself. I love that. Um, could, could be very effective. Um, but for these folks with layered trauma and severe, you know, chronic trauma, I think it is the cat's meow. Um, and then we have two other psychedelic drugs that are, um, under, interesting research uh, considerations right now. Psilocybin is uh, the magic mushrooms, uh, which has been in use, human use for some say 3000, some people say five, some say 10,000 years. I mean, there are uh, cave frescoes of uh, psychedelic mushrooms from 20,000 years ago. So it's been around for a long time. It's very safe from a medical standpoint. Um, the, the danger with psilocybin is more on the psychological. So it, it's scary. Um, and which is different from MDMA, but it is currently in uh, under phase three trials by two different groups, a nonprofit in the US called USONA and a for-profit pharmaceutical in the UK called Compass Pathways. And they're both um, expecting to publish data next year. So that's very close to a completion of the, um, the research uh, process. And th that one is really most studied for chronic depression. So it, it presents an alternative to this model that you and I were talking about earlier of the suppression with you know, suppressing symptoms so that people can function. Suppression is better than not suppression uh, under certain circumstances, but these treatments are really unique because they evoke, they, uh, they're evocative treatments rather than suppressive treatments. Yeah. Um, and then the third one is ketamine, uh, which of course uh, you mentioned earlier, it's a tool that we can use currently. It's, um, it's on schedule three with the DEA. It's readily available in all 50 states. Um, amazing for suicidal depression specifically, um, chronic depression as well. Um, you know, the tools start to get kind of limited in psychiatry when people fail three and four and five different antidepressant trials. And so ketamine um, presents a really incredible opportunity for people who maybe don't want to try another six week trial after failing three or four meds. Mm, wow. So great. Oh, yeah. gosh, I have so many questions. First of all, I just want to uh, jump back because a lot of my co colleagues, patients talk about somatic therapy. Do you want to just define, because that might be before this stage and we both agree that's helpful in conjunction with yeah. this, right? Um, yes. But tell us a little bit, what is somatic versus CBT, right? Cause you talked about yeah. that. that's what we're trained in medical school. So what is yeah. CBT? What is somatic therapies and how might those be useful? And then when would you go to these other psychedelics? Great question. Thank you for that. Uh, so we, um, we can intervene at different levels of processing in the human brain, human mind. And when we intervene or, or we're doing a talking cure or we're having conversation like this, we're mostly using the top part of the brain, the cortical regions, the gray matter, um, that gray layer of the brain when you slice through a brain. Um, but the fight or flight system which is so much involved in trauma tends to be a much less verbal and more primitive part of the brain. It's deeper part of the brain. Um, and what, when you do, when you, when you're a psychotherapist and you work with people like I did for years with this cognitive tool, this, um, top of the processing, you find that the, um, what's driving the dysregulation in the nervous system is coming from below and it, evolutionarily, it makes total sense, right? You could be meditating, you could be writing a book in your cave and the saber toothed tiger runs in and you don't go to problem solving in your mind. What do I do now? You just start running, right? Uh -huh. Your body, you know, adrenals, HPA, everything it kicks in. So it's frustrating. And I think it accounts for treatment resistance that we're, we're trying to work with a part of the brain that's beholden to the part that really owns the trauma. So Somatic therapy um, can be accessed really, one way to talk about it is 
in the movie Born on the Fourth of July, um, Tom Cruise has a classic sort of re-experiencing uh, flashback phenomenon when the fireworks go off, mm -hmm. and he's back in Vietnam, right? So the the way that the body responds to a cue in the environment might not even be consciously experienced yeah. as a thought. It could just be like oh my God, I feel like I want to throw up right now. And I don't even know why. And the reason you want to throw up is because there's something happening in your body that's responding to a cue that reminds this nonverbal part of the brain that you're not safe in that moment. So what happens in somatic therapy is you, you set up the container and you create um, a lot of safety first, and then you go in and you start working with these somatic experiences. And this is a really, as you said, it's an incredibly powerful way to work with psychedelic therapy. They pair really well together. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh, that makes so yeah. much sense. Um, I have just yeah. a little memory of uh, that that puts a point on that is back with my chemotherapy for my breast cancer. I had this red drug called doxyrubicin. It was in a bag. It was bright red. And it was funny because every time I get that chemo, I get really nauseous from the drug. And then for probably a year later, I'd see the color red and I'd get nauseous. And it was that wow. again. And so consciously I'd be like, oh, it's fine, right? Like no big deal. Mm -hmm. But this was that subconscious clue. And and yeah. what happens I think with so many people is there's these little things like our memory from childhood. I even think mold related illness on many levels mm -hmm. is someone had a trauma in their childhood and a mold connection or um, there was mold in their basement. And then they re-experienced that mold. And all of a sudden, whatever was looped to that or connected to that in their childhood or in their past um, brings that same trauma up as well, because for some reason well, it to be right. So this experience, amazing. they they connect to those two things, and I think all the time in our lives, um, if people are aware of the emotions or their sensations in their body, like a nauseous feeling or a, a tight chest, they might be just walking across the street and see a face of someone that subconsciously reminds them of some perpetrator when they were young, and right, they have the right. same feeling. But don't you think there's like 99% of the people walking around, they're not aware of this. And there's like, why am I anxious? Why am I depressed? Why am I afraid? And what's happening yes. is they're getting clues in their environment all the time that are triggering those somatic things that they are not even aware of, right? Absolutely. The The power of the unconscious mind yeah. is not to be underestimated. Yeah. 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 That's what this is gets so exciting for me. So I want to go back because you mentioned NMDA, psilocybin, ketamine. What's the legal status right now on each of these? And you mentioned, I think in maybe September or soon when this is just about to be aired, um, right. that some of this may be legalized. Where are we at with that? Right. So psilocybin and uh, NMDMA remain on schedule one with the DEA. And what that means is that the DEA sees no medical use and sees a tremendous uh, potential for harm from these drugs. And so schedule one is where heroin lives. It's where crack cocaine lives and so on. So um, people who are in the know uh, from a neuroscience standpoint um, think it's preposterous that something like psilocybin or MDMA would be in the same category with these very harmful, you know, really dangerous. I mean, you mentioned fentanyl and, you know, the opiate crisis, like, well, wait a second, what's the actual harm from these right. tools? <laughs> I just love that right? you're saying that because it's like, that's how I can bear it is like some of these things are so much less dangerous than what we are prescribing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous if, if it would be hilarious if it wasn't so tragic, you know, for so many people. Um, so psilocybin, MDMA remain on schedule one. So it's a felony to, um, to possess them, to sell them, to, you know, if you're uh, a doctor to work with them, um, you know, you can get in big trouble. And then a ketamine is already legal as an anesthetic, but it is used off label in psychiatry. So it's not FDA approved for a psychiatric condition, but we use in psychiatry, uh, only about 20% of the prescriptions in psychiatry are prescribed on label. So, you know, to use something off label in psychiatry is pretty common. Yeah. Yeah. Any of you out here there have sleep meds, I bet you your sleep med is an off label psychiatric drug. Not <laughs> exactly. always, but that's a real common way that people right. who like everyday life are probably using off label. And it's very appropriate for medical use to use off label for the right indication. Um, right. So uh, what would be, you've already mentioned some of the conditions, obviously um, uh, traumatic stress, but what would be some of the uh, indications? Um, oh, and I wanted to clarify too. So, so far what you've seen with NMDA and psilocybin, it's been in clinical research trials that you've had the use and the evidence. So right now people can only legally get it in a trial. Is that correct? 
just to clarify. Well, there are some new developments there. So okay. <laughs> the state of Oregon was uh, the first to pass a state measure where folks can go have psilocybin sessions for their own personal growth or personal healing. Uh, we ended up opening a center in Oregon as a part of our training. Um, so we have a practicum in psilocybin for our trainees in psychedelic therapy and part of our year long course. Um, and then Colorado followed right after Oregon. Uh, it's about a year and a half ago now that the measure passed. So, um, our Institute was, um, granted a training license last week. So we're going to be uh, training people in Colorado in psilocybin therapy. And it's what's really cool about the measure in Colorado is that uh, it's run by the Division of Regulatory Agencies. So we can operate under our medical license, under a psychotherapy license, and provide psych, um, psychedelic therapy once all the, um, all, the, all the structures are put in place. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so you can finally actually see what's happening and do this legally. Um, what we talked about, so what would be your indications right now for some of these therapies? And then I want to talk about the risk and drawbacks and things that, right. that we need to be aware of. Great. Well, with uh, MDMA, as I mentioned before, really uh, the, the main event is, is psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I would say again, uh, just repeat that I think for more severe forms of PTSD where other things haven't worked. Um, and we don't know if MDMA therapy could be helpful for other things. It, it just hasn't been done. Um, there, there's one study that was conducted of uh, couples where uh, one member of the couple had PTSD and the other didn't, and both received MDMA, and it really helped uh, the dynamic in the couple and, and helped treat the PTSD in the individual. But outside of that, we don't know if MDMA could help depression, if it could help OCD, if it could help eating disorders. Uh, there's all kinds of possibilities. Uh, but we just don't have the research. With psilocybin, there's been a much wider range of indications that have been studied. So we have depression, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, substance use disorders, um, cluster headaches has been uh, very, very good data with psilocybin. And people are still going with more protocols. Eating disorders are being looked at. Um, end of life anxiety at Johns Hopkins was a big one that Michael Pollan talked about in his book. Yeah. Um, so wide range, and uh, and then we have with ketamine. Um, a most of the research is on chronic depression, but we also have some evidence on OCD, um, bipolar depression. Uh, a handful of studies on anxiety disorders. So it's it's mostly depression with ketamine. Okay. Oh, that's super helpful. So one of the things you're doing and one of the things I wanted to bring you on for is you're creating a training program. So let's talk about um, who could be trained. Is it just psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists? What kinds of degrees could be trained in this legally? And, um, and what are you doing to create this training program? So we're uh, kicking off our seventh cohort next week we haven't we run two cohorts a year so one in july one in january and uh we started out by strictly training people with mental health backgrounds so uh licensed clinicians uh therapists and psychiatrists and nurse practitioners and we realized after a while that there were a lot of medical folks who wanted to get involved and not because they have a mental health background or because they want to be a psychedelic therapist, but because they want to be a part of a clinic or they want to open a psychedelic therapy clinic and they just want to know how to do it safely and um, bring on the right staff with the right background. So we opened up a medical track this year um, for folks with all different kinds of medical backgrounds, um, which has been a new thing. It's been uh, really popular. So we're, we're enjoying training um, a wider range of folks at this point. That's exciting. So you're saying like an internal medicine doctor or a functional medicine MD who's doing, um, wants to get into this, you're providing training for any of those medical professionals that want right. to know how to do this safely and efficiently and um, fantastic. So what is the, a lot of times from what my, again, I am not the expert. That's why I so enjoy learning from you. But one thing that I have heard that is so important as you open up these portals to healing, that you also have the therapy, the container that creates safety. You want to talk a little bit about that? Cause I think that might be the biggest thing that whether it's a patient just seeking it and not knowing where to go to me, it's like, you want to find a place right. that creates that as you open up these feelings and emotions, but I don't know the answer there. Do you want to tell me more about how that looks? 
Thank you for speaking to that. You're 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 speaking my language. I uh, I really have a lot of concerns about the um, misunderstanding of what the opportunity is here, and we could use the ketamine and ketamine clinics as an example of what can go the wrong way. Mm-hmm. So most ketamine clinics that advertise uh, treatment for depression are doing IV ketamine with no mental health support, no therapist, no sitter, no anybody. Um, and unfortunately, you know, in our clinic, we've treated a great number of refugees from these kinds of experiences where they get um, hooked up to an IV, they're put in a darkened room, they might have other people in the room who are also in ketamine. And what happens is, um, as an evocative psychedelic experience, there are traumas that do yeah. come up, like you were talking about the red color in the yeah. in the IV bag. So if no one's there to help that person, uh, then what can happen is more trauma, right? More flooding, more overwhelm. And, um, and then there's even more work to do to heal, help, help that person heal. So it's critical to have a supportive person in your environment who is able to um, protect your safety, but also not interfere with your journey. And that's the art of psychedelic therapy is knowing when to hold them, when to fold them and so on. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it It's interesting as I can just say, as a trained psychiatrist, I had to unlearn a lot of things to get really good at psychedelic therapy. Yeah. I had to stop being a know-it-all. I had to stop um, interpreting someone's experience. I needed to learn how to tolerate extreme states that the the participant needs to go through in order to go get the you know the key at the bottom of the pond or the you know the 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 insight or the link um the forgiveness of the self that can can hide out in nooks and crannies in your mind and it can be very difficult to access so um many of us who have been trained um traditionally and effectively in the way that we were trained um start to get a little scared or a little anxious when people are going through a really intense experience and we might reach for the lorazepam the ativan or we might reach for the you know um if you're a therapist working with a person who's going through something really intense in your office you might call 911 if you don't know how to hold space for that person in that situation or maybe you haven't had your own uh, training with psychedelics, having a personal journey and finding out that you, you can also get really intense when you are on a psychedelic. So anyway, it's, it's really important to have a support person with you the whole time. And, um, we also have to unlearn this, um, pharmacology forward mentality where a person might come in and we've had many patients um, come for ketamine healing, you know, and we do IV ketamine, but we do it with a psychotherapist who's there the whole time. Every minute of every session is the therapist is there. So people will often come in who've been um, enculturated into the psychopharm forward version of psychiatry where they are now believing that the ketamine is going to be the answer to the problem. That's right. Yes. And it can be really hard when someone's very depressed to, it's very delicate to start talking about, well, actually there's going to be some work involved here. Uh-huh. <clears throat> you're, you're going to find out some things with the help of the ketamine that we're going to then need to change your lifestyle and your behaviors and your choices. And this um, awful relationship you have at work is going to have to change. We're going to have to learn boundaries. We're going to have to change your nutrition. We're going to have to get 10,000 steps, you know, and so on and so on. So we, we have a, it's human nature for us to want a quick fix. And I think it's particularly exacerbated in a materialistic culture that we live in, in America, where everything's a quick fix, right? You drive into the drive-thru and get your quick meal, and then you get your I don't know, what do you do uh, at night to shut yourself down? But yeah. it's um, it's tricky for people to, to um, find out that they've got a journey to make. And so then we have to show up for that and we have to help them make that journey. Wow. Oh my goodness. So many things come to mind. I want to touch on in what you just said. First of all, medical professionals are taught to be in control. 
And yes. what I hear you describing is, and this is part of our healing as healers and then our patients healing is when we can truly surrender control because we don't have it anyway. It's all an illusion anyway, right? So the the fact that we think we have control is completely a myth and an illusion. And I think that's the start of healing. And what I heard you say is these therapists or psychiatrists that are along with the patient is we are supposed to be in control of these situations, right? And we actually have to let go of that willingly yeah. so that we can create. And one definition I heard recently that I just love about love in general is creating the space for optimal transformation, whether it's a friend or a loved one or a partner or a child or mother or any of these people or a patient is literally all we are is kind of like you've mentioned before the container that we as the clinician or the, we're not any better, any more knowledgeable in some ways, but what we can do is create a safe space, a complete unconditional love for their best transformation, which means we allow things that before made it, made us really uncomfortable and we right. have to get really, really comfortable with being uncomfortable. But Absolutely. What, what you said there is so key, because I think um, even in just clinic talking to a patient, we have to practice this because if we start to get uncomfortable or get triggered and we're not aware of that, we take away from their experience. And I can see Absolutely. how probably in your experiences with these patients, there's things that could be triggering, could feel like out of control, could feel scary. So we've mm -hmm. got to really come in. And I'm assuming that in your program, you're training the people who are um, assisting this therapy to really let go and deal with their own stuff, right? Because that's right. the best, yeah. It's sort of this view that um, there's no way out except through the experience. And here's here's a simple example that probably a lot of people can relate to. You know, you're you're having a hard moment or you're maybe you just had a car accident or something like that and you're very stressed. And someone says to you, take a few deep breaths. And you know that it's coming from positive intention, right? They, they're they trying to help you, but there's also this other thing happening for that person who's saying, take it to a few deep breaths, is they're saying, I'm very uncomfortable with how uncomfortable you are. Yes. And I want you to do something so I don't have to feel so uncomfortable. And when you do that with a, a, a person in this incredibly tender and suggestible and open state, it's just it can be it can be very damaging to the to the person. Not only are you blocking them from you know, the the right thing to say in that situation is like go deeper into that, you know, yeah. be with that, yeah. Um, go explore that, and then when you're finished exploring, come back and let me know what you found out, you know, yeah. um, so that the person can learn to become sovereign and and really strong in their system where they can actually feel great about exploring the scary places inside of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you, again, I'll just talk personally, because up until 40, I was uh, living above my neck, all here, all mm. cognitive, all analytical, right? It did yeah. it served me well for that time, but I dissociated from my body. And it's no wonder I had cancer and Crohn's and some of the mm. illnesses because I was ignoring my body. In fact, I remember it often be like, shut up body. I got work to do. Don't give me yeah. a hard time. Right? right. So I learned to dissociate. I was a professional an expert dissociator. And in order to heal what you're speaking of as healers, and then as our patients is you have to go back into that body and feel those feels that yes. you have never felt. And I remember when I first started somatic experiencing and started having this anger that I never had before and this fear and this anxiety and the sadness that I never allowed before that wasn't acceptable to come over me. And it felt like I was going to drown. The mm. wave was so great because it had been 40 years of suppression. And yes. I remember just literally like, this is intolerable, but guess what? The first time I let that wave wash over, it was so scary and so overwhelming. Mm. And then the next time was a little better. And now I know yeah. as those emotions come, they're not fun. They're not pleasant, yeah. but this speaks to you and the patient's experiences uh, is actually giving them the tools so that they can experience that wave that seems like it's going to drown them, but allowing them to feel safe in it and then start to own it and be like, no, 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 I can do this. Mm. Because if we shut, if we push, if we resist, if we shut it down, that's when the illness comes and that's when the um, right. psychiatric symptoms come, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. hundred percent agree. And there's a, there's a saying that, you know, we're, we're not going after feeling better. We're going after getting better at feeling. So we're, we're, we're going at the goal here is to get really good, really skillful at what you were just saying of like, I'm good with myself. I'm good with my panic. I'm good with my depression. I'm good with my suicidal thoughts. I'm not going to act on them, but I can accept that that's a part of the landscape inside of me. 
Um, I've, I've been through things like you were just, you know, living a living example in the way that you shared, you know, for the first 40 years I was above here and that got me really far. Like, thank you. Like, yeah. thank you. And there's something there's else more. to do after that. <laughs> there's more to yeah. it. Yeah. And it's scary. I, I just want to speak to that because if you're out there listening, you're a patient that's when you do this, or maybe you had an experience like that. Will, what I love that you said is that, um, there's work to be done and maybe work is not the right word. There's mm -hmm. allowing, there's like experiencing to be done because um, if we just think that, oh, you're going to do this to me, for me, I'm going to receive yes. a gift of the answer. No, <laughs> it yes. requires us to change our thinking, change our experiencing, change our relationship with fear, with control, with uh, surrender. And, and that's where uh, it lies. Now, I wasn't planning on going here, but I've just got to mention this because I have a definite strong belief in a higher power. I know not everyone mm. listening does. I don't know where you're at with that. But for me, I will just say one thing for me that's been my psychedelic therapy is my relationship with a higher power. And to me, it's mm. so close and so real that I've not done these things because I can access the divine just in my everyday mm -hmm. life. And that is my healing. That's my drug. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you find the higher power conversation for your patients? Does that weigh into everybody, somebody? Do they experience anything with these therapies? And are there people like me that feel like they can access that without an assistant therapy? <laughs> well, there, there's a poem of Hafiz that comes to mind that, yeah. that I love. Uh, it's very short. And he says, complain is only possible from the suburbs of God. And what, what I take from that is that the, the beautiful souls that I've worked with over the years, um, more or less universally feel, uh, that they're not in downtown of divinity. Like they, their address is way out in the boonies, right? They're living a long way away from feeling like what they're going through is sacred and beautiful and necessary for their growth. Yeah. So what we find, I mean, I think just thinking back about 25 years of practice in psychiatry, it's it's quite unusual to find a person who is plugged in spiritually who also has uh, crippling uh, mental health problems, yeah. uh, crushing uh, depression or anxiety, because you you might have what we would call some biological factors, like you mentioned Lyme disease um, or mold, mold exposure. You could have some methylation stuff. You could have lots of glyphosate in your gut. I mean, there's all kinds of things that could be going on, but then you're also dealing with what your attitude is toward your experience. And if you are in a state of surrender and, and again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a charged term in our culture, right? Surrender is like running up a white flag. It's like, uh -huh. I give up. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about active yeah. getting with what reality is kind of surrender. It's like, okay, I've got a journey to make here. Um, when people are surrendered to their life, they have a lot less suffering going on. Yeah. They can still have suffering, but it's a lot less suffering. Um in Buddhism, it's called unnecessary suffering when you're also fighting with the fact that you have problems that yeah. you're trying to resolve. <laughs> so coming back to your question about spiritual out, um, spiritual experiences, I think that it's really interesting, the research at Johns Hopkins under Roland Griffiths, he was very convinced that mystical experiences and, and what he meant by that was a, a oneness experience with a, a, a larger divinity or a larger truth than one's personal you know, ego, personal reality was the most potent thing that could happen in psilocybin therapy. And he turned out, he just passed uh, a few months ago, but he, in his career, he, he, he pumped out uh, decades of research on this topic of looking at what happens when people have a, um, uh, a divinity experience or a God experience or a universal spiritual experience. And these people who went through his studies rated those experiences when they had them in literally in the top five experiences of their lives, including the birth of a child into their family. So these are massive experiences, but I, I agree with you that um, psychedelics are just one doorway into that experience. And 
they're not by any means a guarantee you're going to have that kind of experience when you take one. Yeah. Uh, but there are causes and conditions or set and setting things that can be done to uh, improve the odds of having an experience like that. Yeah. Um, but the goal here, as is always the case with pharmacology, whether it's psilocybin or Prozac or whatever the tool is, I think to learn how to have the experience without the pharmacology, yeah. if you can. Yes. Right. So use the tool, get the lesson and then hang up the phone, you know, and uh, <laughs> go on with your life. I mean, that's the, that's the goal. I think when we're talking about mental health is putting the whole system of mental health behind us mm -hmm. in, in the, in the most, uh, efficient way we can. Yeah. Wow. And unfortunately, you know, and this is, it's just so sad to me that daily medications that suppress symptoms are designed as an annuity for the stockholders of the pharmaceutical company. If they helped you get well, they would be a bad investment. Yes. And, and you look at the stocks and, you know, the returns on pharmaceutical companies always outperform the stock market. Yeah. 10, 12, 15, 17% returns year over year. It's insane. Yeah. Wow. What a great And I wouldn't I wouldn't complain if people took that drug three or four times and they were done. Yeah, exactly. If <laughs> we knew it actually trans transformed, but it it really doesn't. Um, so speaking of that, this is a great way to kind of segue into the ending is just what do you see as the future landscape of psychiatry? Because obviously this is at the forefront of what you're doing and seeing the trend. Um, and then Let's talk about your course too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, I think that um, so I might be a little maybe too optimistic. That's my nature, but I do see a future where we can shift what people are looking for by, you know, through education and through using tools that can actually help people put mental health care behind them uh, definitively. And, and that does happen with ordinary psychiatry, um, but uh, it's not quick and it's not inexpensive. Um, people tend to, if they're going to get a really significant result from psychotherapy or, or medication treatment, they're in treatment for years typically. So it's, it's a long and, and arduous and winding road to get well through traditional methods in psychiatry. Um, integrative psychiatry is better than that because you know we can go to root causes and we can look at the gut brain connection as we talked about earlier. Um, but what I like about psychedelic therapy is this access that we can get to underlying trauma that is very hard to get to in ordinary consciousness for way too many people. So I think we're gonna be able to turn the tide on the mental health global epidemic, which is quite scary when you look yeah. at the numbers. But it's going to take time to turn the boat around. And uh, we're going to have to, as practitioners, also redefine what we're trying to do with people. So that's what we're that's what we're trying to do with our training. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for being on the forefront and being the model. And mm. I just love your experience of your own journey, your curiosity, almost mm. like turning away from psychiatry and then kind of getting re back engaged because clearly you're making a difference and you're doing something very important. So where can people find out about you and the class that you're doing in July? And I think this will be out in August. So it'll be probably the January cohort. Right. Thank you. We, um, we can be found at our website, which is psychiatryinstitute.com. That's a mouthful. Uh, or if you just want to Google integrative psychiatry, you'll, you'll see us on the first page. Um, we've been around now for a few years, so yeah, we'd love to hear from from any practitioners in your audience who might be interested to hear more about the course. You got it. Yeah, we have a lot of docs who listen, so we will be sure and share. And if you're driving or listening on your walk, don't worry. Wherever you listen to this podcast, we will have the links in the show notes so you can find them. Um, as always, you can find our show and all the transcripts and all the notes at uh, my website, which is jillcarnian.com. And again, um, the link to psychiatricinstitute.com and I think slash apply is actually directly to the program. So we'll mm -hmm. link that up as well. Um, Dr. Vanderveer, it, after being in the neighborhood with you so many years, it is just a delight and a joy to talk to you. And I just want to end with thank you for the work that you're doing. And most of all, mm -hmm. I'm an energy reader and I just felt this very deep 
peaceful presence and it's probably from all the work you've done, but you bring that same energy that you're bringing to healing in a very real way, even in this interview. And I feel it and I appreciate it because I'm sure that any of your patients or even your people that you're teaching feel it as well. You're modeling it. And thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you so much, Jill. I, I so appreciate you and thank you for, for this show and getting so many voices out there that um, are not necessarily easy to find. So I, I really appreciate the way you curate the, uh, the show and, and uh, the topics that you cover, keeping yeah. everybody up to date and moving forward together. Yeah, we all need each other, don't we? <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks again. And it, like I said, you guys will have a new episode every Wednesday and uh, look forward to talking to you next week.